homework first. And you had some exercises to do. You were going to look at making whole statements. So taking all the things that you learned from Daniel, putting them together in a whole statement. And what you're going to do, we're on page 10 of session 2. You needed to practice making whole messages out of each statement. So write it out in the first sentence. First person. Number one, I see you're getting uptight again. This is an annoyed voice which covers a certain amount of anxiety and hurt. His wife has been silent for 30 minutes following his late arrival home. So here's dear wife. She probably made just a fantastic dinner. It's sitting there getting cold. There's silence for 30 minutes. And he says, I see you're getting uptight again. Now, what's your observation? What are you seeing with your eyes? He's annoyed. Yes, she's been silent. So that's what you're actually seeing with your eyes. You're observing that. What are you thinking about that? Now, you know the background as to why. What are you thinking about that? He's being... He's in trouble again. He's in trouble again. Okay, she's been annoyed. She's being patient, whatever things that going, that's going around in your mind. Oops, hang, hang on, hang on. This is, what are you observing? Yes, okay, the thoughts. What's the thoughts between the two people? Beg your pardon. Thoughts between the two people. What is he thinking? What? Okay, yeah, good, that's true. But he's thinking, yeah, it's all my fault. She's being silent. What have I done wrong? Oh, yeah, I was late home half an hour, and that little thought record's going round and round and round. What thoughts are going around in her mind? Excuse me, but I don't think that's no. references that at all. No. But if there's no uh, self-blame in there, it's just blaming her. I said, you're getting up to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, what for? Mm-hmm. What have I done? Mm-hmm. All right, so what thoughts would be going around in his mind then, Fiona, if you take that stand? He can't understand why she's been silent. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's okay. We can look at it both ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, if that's the quest, if that's the thing, then what's going around in her thoughts? <laughs> yeah, a few chuckles here. What's going around in her mind? Mm-hmm. 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 Or if we're looking at the most obvious to start with, probably that she's saying, well, here, he doesn't even care enough to let me know that he's going to be late. And he's done this before, and she's sitting there fuming. So we'll, we'll follow that scenario. Or, yes, we could jump off in half a dozen different things. But she's, she's fuming that she's here. This has happened before, and what is she going to do about it? What's he feeling? Guilty. Annoyed? Annoyed? Guilty? Mm-hmm. Frustrated. Frustrated? Defensive? Okay, and she? Mm-hmm. Hurt? Hurt. Frustrated. Frustrated? She's withdrawn, so she's closed down. Mm-hmm. Now, what is... What is her needs? We'll start with her first. What what does she really need in this situation? Him to acknowledge that he's late. Mm-hmm. And what does he need? For her to say... But what, what would be the need that would finish up the whole thing? If she could say what? Okay, or here you're late again, can we talk about this? Or to bring it up in the open. Because she's withdrawn. If she's been silent for the last 30 minutes, perhaps she is chewing on this and going over and over and over it. So she needs to bring it out in the open so they can talk about it. Okay, and that could be part of it as well. All right, he has said this to her, I see you're getting uptight again. Now we need to formulate a complete message from her back to him 
So what, what would you answer back for her as a complete message? Good. So she starts out acknowledging his observation and his thoughts and how he sees her feeling. Yes, yes, I am uptight. Good, Tina. What's the next part? Acknowledging what she's been doing the last 30 minutes. So I have been sitting here thinking about what? Mm-hmm. Why you're late, dinner's being ruined. So she's putting it into words. She's bringing it out in the open. And I'm feeling, really and I'm feeling really hurt by that. Mm-hmm. Because I need what? What does she need? What does she need from him? I need an explanation. I need to understand why. Mm-hmm. So in that message, she's not hid- sending hidden messages. She's not hinting. Remember Daniel covered all of that last time? about sending incomplete messages, assuming that you know that your partner's heard you when they don't even have any idea what you're saying. So that's a complete message. Mm-hmm. Next one might be a little bit more complicated, so but... So, yes, she's upset. Mm-hmm. She wants, what, she wants acknowledgement. That, she, that, yes, I'm late. I'm late because of... Mm-hmm. So, you know... What she's saying here, that uh, you don't seem to care? Well, no, because that's then putting the blame back on him. So we're going to take resp- she's taking responsibility so for how she re- feels. Yeah, okay, what's the response then? Okay, start out with, I, yes, I am feeling uptight. Yep. So she's owning her own feelings. I've been sitting here thinking for the past 30 minutes, da 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 So she's still taking responsibility for what she's thinking, for what she's feeling. And yes, I am feeling uptight because, so again, she's bringing it out in the open because for, because this is the second time it's happened or whatever the situation is, second time it's happening. So she's being out in the open with her statement. And I need to be informed if you're going to be late. Now, part of this is, is, remember, working on hidden agendas. So she's not throwing in all kind, kind of blame and guilt and, and innuendos and talking about the secretary and whatever, whatever, when she has no idea really what it is. But she was making a clear message. All right, rather than do the next one, do we need to do the next one? Well, this is the trouble of picking up somebody else's homework and trying to redo it. So I should have had Daniel. Daniel, please help us with the homework. All right. In, fo- in the following exercise, try to make try making a whole message out of each statement. Write it in the first person. I notice that you've been. So that's the observation. I notice that you've been quiet for the last thirty minutes. All right. Okay, so if we want to take it from him, yeah, we could have done it, done it either way, but taking it from him, I notice you've been quiet for the last 30 minutes. I'm wondering if you're thinking whatever, whatever. Does this have something to do with my being late? Does this have something to do with my being late? Good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I need to understand what's happening. Okay? Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> if you have any questions on that, catch Daniel next time. <laughs> How's that for passing the buck? All right, assertiveness, session three. Now, this is a topic that I also need to learn about because I'm one of those 95% of people who don't handle assertiveness very well. So I am learning in this just as much as everybody. Standing up here, I'm not saying that I am an expert in the whole thing. 
Assertiveness, introduction. This is the third session in the series of personal communication skills. We've looked at the importance of real listening and the use of clear expression to make ourselves understood properly. In this lesson, we'll be looking at assertiveness, that is, how to be real in making our needs known. Let me just double-check the tape. I think it's okay. All right. B, Jesus was assertive. Jesus was assertive. Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He had, a great, he had great confidence in the things he said or did because he only did what the Father God, what Father God showed him to do. Jesus told truth in love. Jesus was an assertive person. He had a need for solitude and prayer. He took the time to do this on numerous occasions, even though people surrounding him with, surrounded him with their needs and wants. Jesus did not let others manipulate him, and he did not manipulate others. Jesus is love. Jesus demonstrated the kind of tough love that is called agape, that is, to act in the other person's best possible interest. Usually this means having to experience short-term pain for long-term gain. And that's a good sentence to underline. Short-term pain for long-term gain. In assertive terms, it means telling people unpleasant truth today to avoid relationship breakdown tomorrow. Moses was another assertive person. He led all of Israel out of Egypt, and that was no easy task. You have read how Moses had to be assertive to deal with the stubborn Israelites. But the Bible says this about him. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. But yet Moses had to be assertive. So maybe we ought to start out by asking, what is assertiveness? What is assertiveness? First of all, assertiveness is being real. When we tell people our needs without offending them, it's called being assertive or being real. All of us want to express our wants or needs to others. If we don't, we would soon become everybody else's doormat. Being real is not putting on a mask for others, but becoming genuine. Assertive is not the same as aggressive. Assertive is not the same as aggressive. When people hear the word assertive, they immediately connect it with being aggressive. As we shall see, the two are quite different. Often, though, we need to be trained to be assertive and not aggressive, or the opposite, being passive. When we learn these skills, it's called assertiveness training. Coltier and Gurrier had this to say about assertiveness training. It is not aggression, aggression training whereby you transgress upon the rights and dignities, uh, dignity of another person. It is not a means of manipulating or deceiving others in order to just get ahead. On the contrary, assertion training, as we see it, rests on the foundations of respect. Respect for yourself, respect for others, and respect for your own value system. So when you think about assertiveness, you've got to hang on to that fact. It's not giving away everything so that you're a doormat, and it's not exploding in aggression so that people fear you and, and then the manipulation becomes the way to control other people. But it's being real. It's based on respect for yourself and respect for them. Because if you have no respect for yourself, what are you going to be? A doormat. Number three, the tension between listening and assertiveness. When we listen, we put our own needs on the back burner, but we can't just listen. Sometimes we desire to have our own needs met. The Bible acknowledges our needs when it says, After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. And that's Ephesians 5.29. Under development of either assertion or listening causes limited interactions between two people. When this happens, nothing much of importance takes place in the conversation. 
Now, the other word that people often throw in here and get mixed up with is submission. Sometimes people talk about instead of, instead of passive, they use the word submission. What's the difference between being passive and being submissive? You can be actively submissive. In fact, to have a good sense of your own personal rights and act and voluntarily yielding those rights to somebody else is submission. So it's not doing it because I have no sense of self-worth at all, but it's, it's more the fact that I have a sense of self-worth, so I voluntarily yield my rights to somebody else. And when we're submitting to Jesus, that's what we're doing there. We're voluntarily yielding our rights our thoughts, our feelings to the Lord. Doesn't mean we don't have any thoughts. Doesn't mean we don't have any 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 uh, sense of what you want to do. In fact, often when you're working with people, you have to help them understand what it is that they're giving up or what it is that they're submitting and giving away. Otherwise, it's just mindless being passive. So submission is not the same as passive. It's different completely again. Number four, most people don't know how to be assertive. Experts in communication in the communication process estimate that only about 5% of the population communicate assertively. As a result, some important things never get said. So I don't know about you, but I would say, yep, I'm part of that 95%. Because there are many times when I... I want to say what I need to say and what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And by not doing that, just stepping in being passive, what happens? I just push it down, push it down, push it down, push it down. And if it's some situations, you can only push it down so much. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So, most people don't know how to be assertive. Most of us step into either being passive or when it gets too much for us, it might explode into being aggressive. Number five, communication can be manipulative. Often we try to get our needs met by using manipulation instead of assertion. This manipulation of others can take two forms, by being aggressive or by being passive. We will look more in detail at these forms of communication in the next session. So in conflict resolution, we'll look a bit more on aggression and being passive in, as manipulation. Have you been around people where their their quietness and their their withdrawing is you can sense that you know that they want you to do something. But they haven't told you what it is that they want you to do. They're just being very withdrawn, sulking, um, just not speaking for hours and hours and hours or days. And you know that they're upset. And in some ways, that's a subtle form to get you to do what they want you to do. But with most people who are passive, it's very hard to know what it is that they want you to do if they don't tell you what it is that they want you to do. And so passive people can be manipulative as well. Now, remember, there's no blame in this. There's, there's really no condemnation in it because most people don't realize when they're being manipulative or they don't realize that that comes out of hurt. So if someone has withdrawn and is not talking to you for days on end, they're doing that out of what? Hurt. So it comes out of hurt. And seeing it that way sometimes helps to let down some of the barriers and to begin to talk through things. Because sometimes with a passive person, that's what you have to say. I see by your expression, I see by your withdrawing and not talking to me that I have hurt you. Please explain to me in some way how I have hurt you and then to draw them out. Because a lot of passive people, that's what they want you to do, is to say, come on, talk about it, talk about it, come on, come on, come on, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. And they want you to coax them to talk about it. So sometimes that's exactly what they need, is to be able to talk about it. You actually made that as a statement, rather than asking them as a question. Which one? I Just see this, you know, by, by you, and I'm speaking to you, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. isn't that making an assumption, rather than placing Okay, how would you put it? Mm -hmm. So put it in a question form, you could do that. 
Uh, well, probably talking about assertiveness training, you need to put it in a question form. So you're right on that. Because it could be they're quiet because their pet died, their dog died, or whatever. But at least bringing it out in the open, it gives them a chance to say what it is bothering them. And it could be it's not you at all. So, yeah. So probably, yes, it would be good to put it in a question form. Very often, I think it, it's a man being quiet. Yeah. 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 And even just bringing the situation, asking the question, if he says, no, nothing at all, then you can go away and leave him to whatever it is he's doing. But your need at that point is to clarify it too. So somewhere in there, your need has to be met as to whether you've done something that's offended him or not. And if he says, no, then let it go. Capital D, characteristics of an assert aggression, sorry, characteristics of the aggressive style. In this style of relating, the general idea is to take by force what you assume no one would give you. Again, it's a response out of hurt. It is a means of self-protection whereby you preempt the other person hurting you by not allowing yourself to be vulnerable. In the end, it is a manipulation style that has little regard for the needs or the feelings of others. Now, it would probably be good to go over to the uh, appendix, page 12, because this might help clarify a little bit of this. Now, we've got the two ends of the same line. <clears throat> Passive and aggressive. And where we're trying to get is the middle, which is called assertive. So when a person's passive, again, it's coming out of hurt. But feelings are not expressed, and they're stored up. Communication does not take place. Problem is not, start, it's not stated. And the unexpressed feelings cause self-destruction after a while. Where aggression, feelings are not verbally expressed. They may be expressed by the physical acting out that I am angry, I am upset, I am frustrated in all of this. So feelings are not verbally expressed except by abuse, verbal or other. The problem is not specifically stated during the abuse, and aggression hurts others. So it's like those are the two ends of the, of the spectrum. Now leave that for a minute. This, what we're going to talk about is the aggressive part of it, so go back to where we were. Page 2, Characteristics of an Aggressive Style. This style of relating, the general idea is to take by force what you assume no one will give you. Again, it comes out of hurt. Number 1, the typically aggressive behavior. The typically aggressive behavior. We are all familiar with the aggressive style. It stands out and is meant to do so. It is meant to advertise don't cross me or I'll fix you good. In this style of relating, the person typically, number one, forcefully states their opinions, feelings, or needs. Secondly, always wins the argument. Why? Why would the aggressive person always win the argument? Because the other person's backing down. So out of fear, out of intimidation, whatever, they win the argument. Speaks very loudly. I can use rude, abusive, or sarcastic language, presents a domineering manner, and is a bulldozer to others. Number two, the perceived advantages of the aggressive style. So someone who uses aggression, this is one reason why. As we have seen, aggressive, aggressive people find some self-benefit in that approach. 
The perceived advantages are, number one, they more easily get their material or physically physical needs met. They can better protect themselves against attacks from others. They can manipulate others to do their will by strong arm tactics. They can gain they retain control over their lives and others. The other person has to back off and so there is more space. They feel good about themselves because they have won. But it's one of those situations that really is a lose lose situation. Because they may have won the battle but they lost the war. That sense of being protected is really just an illusion. The attack is the Mm -hmm. So the attack it really is a way of I'm repeating it for the tape, not because I didn't hear you. But yes, it's it's a way of defending themselves and it's an illusion. The the sense of being protected is an illusion. Because if you're with an aggressive person, what does that inspire you to do? To either back down or yes, be aggressive yourself. And if you've got two aggressive people going at it, does much does do many conflicts get resolved? No. You get holes in the wall, kids screaming, but most most situations do not get resolved. Now, what's wrong with the aggressive style, the perceived faults of the aggressive style? In seeking advantage over people, the aggressor doesn't realize that he or she is trading short-term gain for long-term disadvantage. Here are some of the faults of this style. First of all, the other person is hurt. The other loses. The other is overpowered. The other will react in a negative way. The other will try to protect themselves by, one, trying to be more forceful against the aggressor, withdrawing from the relationship, using manipulation and subterfuge sub refuse to counter the scorching of their needs. The relationship will be harmed. The needs of the aggressor will not be met because people will not give in on the inside. The tactic is counterproductive in the long run. One's needs for intimacy will not be met. Alienation from others takes place. Love is undermined. And this creates a win-lose situation where the aggressive person wins and the other misses out. Wins in the short term but not in the long term. Any comment about any of those? Ending in confusion and bewilderment. Ending in confusion and bewilderment. Mm -hmm. And often um, they very So they sometimes use it to cover up their own inadequacies, yes. Mm -hmm. And often inside they feel very insecure that they can't put it into words, they can't express their emotions, and so it just keeps going, battling and dropping in and in and in until, bang, it just explodes. Mm -hmm. And certainly the feeling of being overpowered. I'm sure some of you have been around someone that just turns aggressive. And you feel like you just gonna go, just curl in, because the the physical, verbal, emotional blast that you're getting is just like scorching heat, and and it's hard to stand up to it, especially if there was a little tiny spark of something you did do wrong. You know, maybe you didn't carry out the garbage when Dad asked you to, and he turned such verbal and emotional blast on you that you were really hurt because that element of you didn't do something that he asked you to do. But certainly the aggression and the hostility that just flooded in was not called for, was not asked for. And it certainly didn't teach that little child much other than to do what? To withdraw, be more afraid of dad, whatever, avoid him the next time, be more sneaky about it, all kinds of things. So there are lots of... of the, the person themselves feels their advantages to being aggressive, but there are lots of disadvantages as well. And even those advantages really aren't advantages in the long run. And the modeling effect that it has on the children, yes. 
If they live with violence and abuse, what are they going to grow up knowing or thinking is normal, is violence and abuse. Yeah. Okay, the passive style. Characteristics of the passive style. In this style of relating, the person assumes a, pa a, a submissive position. They are very agreeable and don't force themselves on others. The passive communicator has an air of defeat about them and almost invites others to take advantage of them. However, when important needs aren't being met, manipulation may be used to get those needs met. That first statement I'd sort of like to take apart and put another word in instead of submissive. What could you put in there instead of submissive? And many times we find people like that in counseling where the wife comes in and it's like she's played that role ever since she was a little girl. And she knows very well how to play the role of being a subordinate, maybe to dad or to brothers or older sisters or whatever. So she steps into that role. Encouraged in a funny way? Yeah, probably because on the outside she seems like she's being obedient. It's like the, 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 little, the joke about the little boy, the teacher in the classroom says, sit down. He, he, she says three times to the little boy, sit down, and he won't do it. Sit down, he won't do it. Third time he says, okay, I'll sit down. But on the inside, I'm standing up. So it's that sort of attitude. On the outside, the behavior might be giving, giving in. But the heart attitude is just encouraging and you know, just building it up and building it up and building it up. And pretty soon what happens? Boom. Yeah. Now, the typical passive behavior. People who use this style of communication are often perceived by others, and others are, sorry, are often perceived by themselves and others as easily taken advantage of. They often, are, although not always, use excessively soft voice, have a submissive demeanor of a bowed back and a drooped head. Hesitant in their speech, don't maintain good eye contact, shrug their shoulders, reap, or weep and cry easily because they're just carrying so much stuff inside. Just swallowing and swallowing and swallowing and swallowing. The perceived advantages of the passive style. Just as, the, as in the aggressive mode, people use the passive style because they judge it to be the best way to get their needs met. And again, it could be because that's how, as children, they learn how to get their needs met. By becoming maybe the goody-goody in the family or the one that always did everything just right. That just took the abuse from dad and didn't say anything back. Often they have been brought up this way by their parents. Often society wants us to be nice people. Some of the perceived benefits from this style are, one, avoids conflict with others, not having to take on as much responsibility, keeping familiar habit patterns, purchasing the approval of others, enticing others to protect themselves because they can't, sorry, enticing others to protect themselves, in other words, to protect the person that's passive because they can't do it, the manipulation of others through weak tactics like tears and being labeled nice. Now you have to be a little bit careful, careful when you start talking about passive people and using tears to manipulate because a lot of passive people are hurt. And so the tears are a sign of hurt, not necessarily that they want to get their own way. What this is talking about are passive people that learn to use their tears to bring sympathy from other people. So that it's like in the middle of an argument, they burst into tears and husband says, oh, there, there, sweetheart, it's all right. I really didn't mean that after all. And they use it as a manipulation, not because they're just hurt and the tears come. I've seen that sort of statement used on a lot of people that do have you know, fairly high emotions and do burst into tears. And other people say they're being manipulating when that's not what that person's doing at all. They're just hurt. Now that person does need to learn how to be assertive in their statements and to say what's hurting them and being able to handle the conflict before it gets to the point where they're in tears. Mm -hmm. 
Well, in the counseling room, you probably see it more for hurt because that's not a conflict situation. So this is like in a conflict situation when, when um, they can't get their way one way, they use tears as a manipulation. Now, we, we, we want very much to, to have a healthy expo- expression of emotions, and tears can be a healthy expression of emotions. But when people learn to use it to get what they want then it's manipulation. So in a counseling situation, most tears come from hurt when you're talking to them. Well, if he's saying she always cries, probably it, by that time it really is out of a lot of hurt because she's just, her, her emotions to the point she can't express it any other way. And then her tears come out of frustration. Yes, yeah, because more hurt is done by assuming it's because she's manipulating than whether she's just doing it because she's hurt. In fact, I really haven't seen that many people use tears as manipulation in an argument. Usually tears are a sign of frustration, just not being able to put into words. But people do learn how to do that. Yeah, but even that one you got to be careful of because the reason that, that that person is tears is they're on overload. And so by learning how to work through the emotions of the whole thing, then she can come around and talk about truth or he can come around and talk about truth. And some of it, I'm not sure if Daniel got into talking about emotions and logic and male and female stuff. Did he get into that? Some say yes, some say no. <laughs> He's mentioned it. Um, just debating whether we ought to get sidetracked for a minute. But Okay, about six or seven years ago, the Lord taught us a really important truth on that. And if he's already shared this with you, then say, well, he's already shared it with you. Um, I was seeing a specialist down in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Well, he's done that. Okay, yeah. so the Lord showed us then that, that the tears were a sign of frustration, and I was to the point of almost being in tears because I was feeling betrayed, that, that I wasn't getting my point across and that he was defending the other guy. So what had to happen, there are about three or four people here who haven't had the story, so I'll just do it real briefly. Is that all right? Um, so I was seeing a specialist down in Melbourne, but he was a court re- a reference uh, psychologist, so he'd often be called into court over some sort of testifying over a case. And so he was often 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes late. One time he was over an hour late, and I was fuming because he wouldn't let his receptionist know. And so here were all, his whole waiting room full of people waiting for this appointment, and he was an hour late, and you know he didn't even bother to tell his receptionist that was happening. So on the way back to Hillsville, I was chewing on Daniel's ear. I was just, ah! And Daniel was saying, yeah, but maybe he had a good reason why he was late, or... And so what was that doing to my emotions? <laughs> Where what he needed to do was stop and say, yeah, he, he probably was, you know, he was very thoughtless. He didn't really, really consider his patience in his waiting room. I agree with you, Susan. Yeah, it's pretty much, I'm angry at him too. And then I could have stopped and been logical back with him once I knew he understood where I'm coming from. So a lot of times tears are, are, are that sort of a thing, where a wife just, she isn't feeling like her husband's hearing her, she isn't feeling like he's understanding, she isn't feeling like he's with her, and so just out of frustration, she bursts into tears. Now, is that manipulation? Well, I'm, I'd be pretty hesitant to say it's manipulation. Yeah. Now, some husbands feel it's manipulation because then they feel, okay, she's crying again, so I've got to stop and feel sorry for her and go pat, pat, pat. There, there, dear. You know, and so they flip into that sort of stance where they feel like they've been manipulated again. They can't say what they really want to say. So I suppose in that sense, yeah, it's stopped the conversation. It's brought everything to a halt. It's changed the focus of what was trying to happen. It's prevented clear messages from happening. 
But then you have to question whether clear messages were happening on his side anyhow. Was he really understanding where she was coming from or was he just beating her over the head with his logic? Because if that happens, then it's a lose-lose situation. Or he might win the argument, but he's lost the war. So, yes, minimizing, not acknowledging, yes. <laughs> oh, that's a good one, Jeff. So if you want to talk about manipulation, you know, that, that was the same thing too. Yeah. yeah. Rather than how, okay, how could, this is sort of next week's topic, but how could have Daniel and Susan have resolved that conflict? Here I am just... And Daniel's being now, da na 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I see you're getting upset by this, Susan. Yeah, I'm, I'm upset about it, too. We've just wasted four hours of a good evening. One hour down, one hour there, one hour trying to sort this up, and one hour getting back home, so... I'm upset by it too. I mean, yeah, let's. I understand your 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 frustration because I feel it too. And then, and then the logic. That's right, because by that point, most people are ready to say, "Yeah, I guess I am steamed up about it a bit, and it's not doing us much good." So, yeah, okay, I I hear what you're saying, and yeah, maybe he did have a good reason. And I, I don't know what the reason was because I canceled it after that. I wasn't going through it anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, too much was too much. But you can see how both styles can manipulate because it closes down the real communication. So I suppose on that sense, yes, tears can be a manipulation. Because both people need to learn to go back and redo their communication style. Because the, ar the object of all conflict is to do what? To have a resolution. It's not conflict to beat him up, so that causes more conflict, that causes more conflict, and it just, you know, escalates. And pretty soon you have this huge big mushroom cloud, and everybody's gloomy and doesn't talk to anybody else, and on and on and on, because that doesn't help either. So the object of all this stuff is clear meaning, clear communication. And sometimes conflict can be a good thing. Here I'm almost talking about next, next sessions. But conflict can be a good thing if it clears the air, if it's constructive comment. Because we can't live life without conflict. We're always going to have conflict. But it's, how, again, how we handle it that's the important thing. There needs to be emotions before the logic. And sometimes it needs to be emotions before logic, if that person's emotional. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was... Particularly male, female. So particularly male, female. Yes, and that's true. Not gonna get the other way around, logic before emotions is not going to work. Either. That's very true. Logic before emotions before does not work. Mm -hmm. emotional, yes. Not that's true. That's true. Because emotions are one of those things that are just all over the place. And when you're very, very emotional, it's hard to stop and be logical, where when you're logical, you're logical. I suppose sometimes when you're logical, it's hard to enter in and be emotional, and then that's the other side of the coin that's a bit of a problem. But, yes, emotional first and then logical. Sometimes one group, some men don't use that logic as a block of this day, and they mm -hmm. get scared by that kind of emotions or mm -hmm. extent, so mm. Yeah, so logic can logic become a block. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. So if we were going to rewrite this, we would say there's several blocks to communication. And one is being overly emotional, one is being overly logical, another is being passive, another is being aggressive. Probably come up with our own little list, couldn't we? Because all of it's stopping real communication problems. And yes, sometimes even tears, that stops real communication. However, because of the emotional nature of it, both people need to learn to say, okay, this is getting us nowhere. You, uh, the emotions are to the point that it's hard to listen to logic. So I'll support your emotions, and I agree with you on the emotional level. And so she knows she's supported. And then if if they have to, then put a limit and say, okay, how about let's just both go for a walk and come back in half an hour, and when we can both calm down, 
and both see each other's point and talk it through a bit more. And then that's a good resolution of it. So being passive does block open communication. Being aggressive does block open communication. Now, where were we up to? Uh, characteristics. Number three, perceived faults of the passive style. Now, this is using passive when people just withdraw, become a doormat, don't say anything, sulk, be moody, all those other things. People using this style often don't see the negatives of their behavior. They don't see that they, that the, they don't respect or value their own needs, values, opinions, or feelings. Now, if I'm withdrawing, how am I not respecting my own needs, my own values, opinions, or feelings? Because you're not expressing them. So you aren't taking, you're not taking the challenge to try to put that into words to give a clear message about how you're feeling. And particularly if it's a habit pattern that we've learned from our parents, and we just pick it up and we pass, we just carry it through. But yeah, it's a sign of not respecting ourselves enough to make a, enough of an issue out of it to talk about it. It allows others to disregard their needs, values, opinions, and feelings. Permits others to take advantage of them. So if I'm passive and I've withdrawn and I'm not talking to Daniel for a day, does that... Would that not possibly, if Daniel was that kind of person, that he could take advantage of that? So if he's saying, well, Susan's in a huff about this, I'll just go do what I want anyhow. Mm. Now, passive people are often too timid to express their real needs. And you find this one a lot with counseling. When the wife has just swallowed it year after year after year after year after year. And she probably doesn't even know what her real needs are anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. Never had needs acknowledged as a child. Mm -hmm. Now, quiet, passive, withdrawing people invite domina domineering by others. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh-huh. And have you worked it through enough to sort out why that that would attract controlling people? And somebody offers some insights to Judy in a loving way. If you have a circle, and one half of the circle has gone inward by not setting boundaries, What's that going to do to the other half of the circle? Mm -hmm. it automatically increases that. So if you're this here, you're going to attract someone that has the need to expand it. And that's then, of course, part of the problem when the Lord rebalances things. Because this person has to go that way, and that person has to go that way so that somewhere in there there's sort of a balance between the two. Now if he doesn't, if if the partner does not want to, because sometimes this is a, the female male thing, mm -hmm. if that partner does not want to, but that partner does, what's going to happen? <laughs> You're going to have conflict. And so definitely, definitely this sort of thing needs some assertiveness training. Because this person has to learn how to state their needs in such a way that this person is not going to be overwhelmed by them and not feel like, oh, well, they're taking advantage of me and they want me to kill part of me. That can often come as a great relief to the person who's in control because they think it's burdening the sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. When they realize they don't have to take responsibility, it's really. Yes. I mean, I don't have to 
Yes. So sometimes it can cause a, a big sigh of relief that the other person's finally standing up for themselves and saying, no, this is the boundary. Yeah, especially when it comes to responsibility. Yeah. And those of you that have heard Daniel and I long enough know the story of the old nature because that's the exact picture of the old nature. Because Adam was the one that stepped back and let Eve do what she did. And so ever since then, females have been doing what? Taking, yeah, taking more and more responsibility. And the husband's been doing what? Mm -hmm. Backing down and let her in here do that. Ooh, yeah, okay. (laughs) So to undo that, we have to learn to do the opposite. We have to learn to not do... Women have to learn to not do what Eve did, and males have to learn to not do what Adam did. So to step into that void, step into that vacuum, and and receive their God-given dominion in the family. Not domination or aggression, but their God-given place in the family. So yeah, it's... You look around you, and it's a very common situation. But setting boundaries, yes. Yes. Highly recommend do some work. If if you find that you're in either one of these two different groups or see characteristics of yourself in either one of those groups, then learning assertiveness, learning how to set boundaries for yourself and for the other person will begin to raise your self-respect and that other person's respect for you will grow. So it invites domineering domination by others have angry outbursts due to the buildup of suppressed emotions, have to manipulate others to get their needs met, including emotional blackmail. Oh, dear. Someone like to define emotional blackmail. Or give me an example of it. Maybe it's a better one. Yeah, you tell your mother, okay, Mom, if you don't, You know, I don't like the way you're treating me, Mom. If you don't let me do what I want to do, I'm 18. I'm going to leave home. And Mom says, oh, no, please don't. Please don't leave. Mm -hmm. And so the teenager has Mom over the barrel. So that's emotional blackmail. Or, um, yeah, okay. Allows others to shrug off responsibility. (coughs) Develops a low self-esteem. It hates aspects of themselves often has physical problems due to the repressed nature of emotions. Anytime we keep swallowing our emotions, they're sort of like corks in the bathtub. Can you hold corks under the water for very long? Not that many people have ever tried, but they don't. They just keep popping up somewhere else. And emotions are like that. Emotions have to be listened to, validated, because if they don't, then they just come up some other way. And a lot of people that you see in the counseling rooms that have problems with their back, have problems with their stomach, have repeated migraines, on and on and on and on, are often, not always, but often because of repressed emotions. They haven't learned how to express their emotions in a healthy way. And that's part of the 95% of the population. So, yeah, it's a journey, though. Let's not bring anybody under condemnation, because it is a journey. Then often have physical problems, then create lose-win situations where the other person wins, the passive person misses out. Any comments on all of that? By now you're probably saying to yourself, yeah, I'm a bit in that one, or I'm a bit in that one, or... But just hang on, hope is coming. That's true, because, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the person's perception of I've won this argument is an illusion. I mean, they may have gotten their own way and, and gets to watch their own favorite TV show and so satisfied whatever it is that they wanted to do for that moment, but they haven't won in the long run. That's true. How about before we start F, how about let's go and take a break. Thank <laughs> you.
Now, we've talked about the, the aggressive style and the things that are wrong with it and why people use the aggressive style, because they think they're going to gain control over that situation. And we talked about the passive style, and usually the passive style is based somewhere in there on lack of self-respect. So a sense of standing up for ourselves, of saying, this is how I feel, these are my needs, and this is where I am. It's usually a, an avoidance of conflict sort of attitude when it comes to being passive. And a lot of it we've learned from our families, whichever one of those two styles. However, we've seen the modeling of our parents influences which one of those styles that we use. Now we can see from what we've talked about, neither one of those two styles is completely healthy. The aggressive style gets their, wi their will, but mainly by bullying somebody else into being in the subordinate position. The passive one wins in a sense of taking that subordinate position, and then everybody else revolves around that passive person. So both styles have big problems with it. That's why we have to learn what is assertiveness. So capital F, characteristics of the assertive style. So it's not aggression. It's not being passive. It's called assertiveness. One way of looking at assertion is to see it, is to, is to see it as a way of defending one's space or territory and relating to the other per people in society in a non-destructive way. So you can see that the aggressive people would not see it. Their style of confrontation is not non-destructive. And the passive people wouldn't be reserving a space and a territory for themselves. They're giving in. So assertiveness is neither passive or aggressive, but falls somewhere in between. The Bible tells us to be assertive. Doesn't tell us to be a doormat, does it? Was Jesus a doormat? Did he just take and take and take and swallow and swallow? No. He gave as good as he got. But he did not flip into being aggressive either. He wasn't aggressive in his communication style. So he was assertive. The Bible tells us to be assertive. We are all made in the image of God and have dignity. Neither the other person nor myself is more important in God's sight. Agape love, that is self-sacrificing love, does so in the contact, context of sacrificing wants, not needs. And that's very important to get a hold of. God doesn't expect you or demand that you be self-sacrificing in your needs. Right? He says, if you've got two coats, what do you do with the second coat? You give it away. He doesn't say, give the only coat that you have when you're freezing to death to somebody else. And a lot of times that's how what a passive person would do. Neither does he say, if you're cold and you've got one coat, go rip off a second coat from somebody else. <laughs> and that's the aggressive style. So it's based on a sense of self-respect and dignity and self-worth. <clears throat> Typical assertive behavior. So what are some of the characteristics of assertive people? They are people who, one, respect their own spirit, soul, and body. Acknowledge the dignity, <coughs> excuse me, the dignity of all human beings and the sanctity of life. They are aware, even unconsciously, that human beings have intrinsic value and are not just animals that can be manipulated. Assertive behavior respects the rights of others as long as they don't interfere with the legitimate needs of anyone. Shows sensitivity to others without being passive. Are in touch with their own needs and ask for them to be met without being aggressive. And assertive people assume their own responsibilities without taking the self-respect away from others by taking on responsibilities that is not theirs. These people establish and grow relationships. They have an impact on the world around them. Jesus was a classic, assertive person. They have a true joy of life that George Bernard Shaw says is being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one 
the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. <clears throat> That's an excellent quote. quote. So the true joy of life, being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. The being a force, the being as force of nature instead of the feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. Might be a little overstated, but the heart of what he's trying to say we probably all agree with. Psychologists have noted these assertive people who live their lives to the are, sorry have noted these assertive people who live their lives to the full. Abraham Maslow studied these psychological healthy people and called them self-actualizing. He concluded from his research that they were without one single exception involved in a cause outside their own skin in something outside of themselves. This being the case, every born-again Christian should be self-actualized and full of the joy of the Lord. Christians should be living for an external cause outside of their present existence that encompasses the needs of others. The consequences of using the assertive style. Following are some benefits of using assertive style. That would have made a big mistake. I would have had to come back and redo it. <laughs> Okay, they benefit society and families from less conflict. They attempt to create win-win situation where everybody wins. They're more likely to com accommodate others' needs, more likely to pursue and get their own needs met, have better self-esteem, they like themselves, foster better relationships, manipulate others less and so carry less guilt, have reduced fear and anxiety, encourage intimacy, are free to be themselves. Less energy is used in keeping it facades. Are appreciated by others for their genuineness. Have the approval of others for being real. Have better physical, spiritual, and emotional health. And that last one is a great, big, huge one. It's true. Because instead of just hanging on to the griefs and gripes and groans and grievances and pains and agonies. We learn how to say them in a healthy way, taking responsibility for ourselves. Not dumping on other people as though they are lower than what we are or less of a human being than what we are, but asking for that, that space to meet our own needs and our own self-worth. Three, some cautions on becoming more assertive. But I shut the door. Some cautions. Becoming more assertive does have some downsides. Remember like the circle we were talking about. There's some downsides if you get it, have to get into that. As in everything good, there is a price to pay. Though very desirable, assertiveness can cause problems such as people may react to the changes in our style of communication and attitude. People may resent the lessening of dependence on them. People may be wary of a greater intimacy created by assertiveness. You possibly may wish to stop meeting everybody else's needs and see to your own, which will upset some people. You become more vulnerable to others when you can't, you can't demand or manipulate. As you become more open, others require privileged information, which can be misused. Assertive people need to know more about themselves. This can be very painful as we have to face our inadequacies. Telling the truth in love is being assertive. Let's look at Appendix A. So we looked at Appendix B. Appendix A is telling the truth in love. 
Ephesians 4.15 says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Speaking the truth in love. The scripture tells us about a process of communication. Secular psychologists call it assertiveness. What we say to one another can have profound effects. Again, the tongue has a power of life and death, and those who love it will eat the fruit. And those who love it will eat its fruit. When we disobey telling the truth in love, relationships will always be damaged. There are at least three aspects to this problem. Number one, telling. Number one, it says telling versus not telling. So number one, not telling. Many people are afraid of conflict. That is, they avoid bringing up issues that may upset the others. But how is anyone, anything ever resolved if it isn't discussed? Relationships, relationship issues seldom heal by themselves. Jesus encourages us, if your brother sins against you, go and, t- go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. We are responsible to keep our relationship partners well informed, both on what we are doing and how we are feeling. So the first thing about that statement is telling. We have to tell. We have to bring it out in the open. We have to be willing to face it. Then the second problem about uh, the second thing in that scripture is not telling truth. So first of all, it's not talking about things is a problem. Second is not talking but not telling the truth. We are all capable of stretching the truth. But when we are depressed or angry, we can say untrue, malicious things to make ourselves feel better. In 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. And then the second thing that's very common that we all do is not using love to tell the truth. So telling truth in love. Three parts. Telling, telling truth, telling truth in love. We can define agape love as choosing the best possible outcome for the other. When I try to impart truth to someone, it has to be done in such a way that they retain dignity and still are able to choose their own destiny. Bible bashing is one sorry result of not using love to tell the truth. So the Bible does encourage us to tell the truth in love. Let's go on back to where we were on page uh, 7. Each of us has our own style of communication. People's styles of relating to one another are unique and individual. We are seen by other people to a large extent by how we communicate. Following are some of the reasons why we have the style that we do. First of all, we adopt a style through our upbringing. So in other words, we watch Dad being aggressive with with Mom and the rest of the kids, and that gets him his way. He gets to watch TV, the program that he wants to watch, because he's bullied everybody else into being quiet and not watching what they want to watch. So we say, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll use that myself. So we use it on our brothers and sisters. We use it on our roommates. We use it on our married part, marriage partner. Now, our personality suits certain ways of behaving. And we are comfortable with our style. We practice it, practice it for 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, so we're comfortable with it. And it seems to work for us. Our style also seems to protect us from conflict, we think. And then we are taught a certain style of, we can be taught a certain style of relating. So even though all of that is like the the computer program that's in there, we can still be taught a different way to relate to other people. Next. Okay, number one. Uh Uh-huh, okay, I didn't realize you had as blanks. We can adopt a style through our upbringing, our personality suits certain ways of behaving. We're comfortable with our style. Our style seems to work for us. Our style seems to protect us. However, we can be taught a certain style of relating. So we can, even though we've grown up and practiced being passive, we can be taught how to be assertive. You're very welcome. Our style can, our styles can and do change. 
Although all of us have a dom- predominant style, this does not mean we can't vary it from time to time. Passies are aggressives sometimes. Passive people often get so frustrated that their needs not being met that they can assume a very aggressive mode over important issues. It's like the idea of <coughs> the gunny sack. Has Daniel talked to you about the gunny sack? Okay, here you've got this gunny sack. And in it goes all kinds of stuff. Rubbish, 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 rubbish. People dumping on you at work. People dumping on you at home. Just swallowing it, saying, oh, I'm not going to cause conflict. I'll just take this. I won't answer back. I'll just go ahead and be a good girl, and I'll just take it all in. But what happens to the bag? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, what's going to happen to that gunny sack? Right, it's going to burst. And you know what? It's going to go all over everywhere. Drop the bundle. You're drop the bundle, yeah. And sometimes innocent people get hit with some of the flying debris that comes around. They might not, you know, you might not mean to take it out on a roommate or a husband or a son or a daughter, but they're in the middle of it and out it comes and kaboom. So the passive can become the aggressive. But it's mostly because if you haven't learned to deal with all that junk and rubbish, I mean, it's like we just keep stuffing it down. Gunny sack, gunny sack, stuffing it down. Until after a while, the gunny sack just cannot hold one more tiny drop. And the you-know-what then just hits the walls everywhere. So just, yeah. So passives can become aggressives. Aggressives can become passives. Aggressive styles can be so guilty over trampling over people that they react and become passive for a while. So someone who's just got an explosive anger temper can be so condemned at hurting his wife or children or whatever that they just take it all in for a while and just close down and withdraw. But that doesn't mean they've changed their style. It just means that they've imploded for a while. Number three, we all use different styles at different times. All of us have used these styles from time to time, depending on the circumstances. And number four, we all adopt assertive styles sometimes. Of course, we all have been assertive as well. The issue is how to become more consistently assertive. I remember reading an article in, the, in a magazine that talked about sometimes in the stew of life, you have to be an onion. You can't always be a potato. Sometimes you have to be an onion. So the the question is when to become an onion and when to be a potato in the stew of life. And for a lot of people, that's a big question because they're either always onions or they're always mashed potatoes. And so when to become an onion. Okay, exercise number one. I want you to list five areas where you would like to be more assertive and write an assertive goal for yourself. Now, your instructor will give you some examples. Oh, good. (laughs) Okay, let me give you an example. If I am hooked into the fact, and forgive me if you've heard this example before, because it's one of Daniel's favorites. (laughs) Some people know what's coming already. If If I am hooked in, I'll change it around. I won't make it Daniel's example. If I am hooked in to my self-worth being based on having my house spotlessly clean because my mother-in-law just might drop in any time and then if she, you know, she just might dump on me because my house is not spotless. So I've got a lot of energy invested in getting my house spotless. However, my husband likes to take the toothpaste tube and he squeezes it in the middle. Not only does he squeeze it in the middle, but sometimes he leaves globs in the sink. And it just bugs me. It just bugs me. All right, so I come in in the morning and I see blob, 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 and water, 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 and I think, ah, okay, clean up, clean up, clean up, clean up. Next morning I come in, same thing. And my, temp- my temper is beginning to rise. After about one week, how am I going to feel? Well, maybe that's about three weeks, but I am getting quite irritated, quite irritated. But I don't go talk to Daniel about it. I just keep taking it in, taking it in, 
taking it in. After a month, okay, now I am really fuming. Not only that, I've got him in my sights, and I'm just going to catch him. Sorry? Yes, I'm going to catch him, going to do it, and I am just going to kaboom and explode all over. I might call him all kinds of names and say, you're just a, a messy pig, and I'm just always, you're just a little boy, and I'm always cleaning up after you, and I'm just so tired of it. Why can't you just get your act together? You're just like your brother, and, and, and blah, blah. And I've just dumped it everywhere. And then I march out of the bathroom, and he turns around, and he says, what was that all about? Because he has no idea that I've been storing all this junk up again and again and again and again. So, one area I would like to be more assertive and write an assertive goal for myself would be what? Toothpaste tube. <laughs> Toothpaste tube. So, it would be the goal. Speak up sooner. Speak up sooner. Good. So, after about the third day of cleaning up his mess, what could I say? Good. So you're looking at a three-part statement. Good. And we'll hang on to that because we'll get to a three-part statement pretty soon. But right now, just write down some things in your life where you've sort of just been thinking about, yeah, I need to be more assertive in this, 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 and this area. So you can come up with five just to start with. Maybe even coming up with one would be good. is sort of ticking away. How about see if you can come up with two and then we'll go on to the next one. <laughs> okay, everybody come up with two. Now you don't need to show these to me or to anybody else, but just hang on to them for a minute. <laughs> because the next thing would be to write out the goals of what you want. So go back to those two statements. You've got two situations where you would like to be more assertive. So the next thing is to take each of those statements and write out the assertive goal. What is it you're after in that situation? So in my case, it was for Daniel to clean up the mess behind him, to take care of his own messes. So that, no, that's a very good example. Very good example. So if you could have at the, the maybe second or third time when he did that, if you could have said that at the, that point, could have avoided all those months of uh, uh, of agony. Good, Elizabeth. And the point of that is he was happy to do, you know, yeah, I want to ask. Most people, you know, they don't re they he, he really didn't realize what an impact he was having on just with that behavior. He didn't realize that. And most people are reasonable enough if they hear a request put in a three part statement, they're they're reasonable enough to listen to somebody else's request. In a three part statement. So Elizabeth, see if you can give us a three part statement. It goes, I feel when you can you please. So I feel what? I, uh, I feel how I feel. 
Good. So can you please? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now you might not. That was the third one. Can you please? So I feel when you. So I feel frustrated. I feel irritated. When you. Can you please? Mm-hmm. So it's a little three-part formula for those people who like formulas. Now it might not have to be as formal as that because what Elizabeth said to him worked. He could see the frustration, he could read the annoyance, he could hear her request, and he could see why it would have been a frustration. So he could hear her request, it was reasonable, it didn't affect him <laughs> that much to take an extra couple of seconds and do that. So he was happy to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he would have. And then it would have been, you know, his, his will against yours, and why should I do this? And exactly. So with the toothpaste thing, what should I have said to Daniel? I feel frustrated, upset, annoyed. When you leave a mess all over the bathroom, can you please clean up after yourself? And then he could choose to say, well, up your nose with a rubber hose. That's your job, woman. <laughs> so somewhere explains the truth. It's the mess in the sink. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So you don't mind where he squeezes it. Well, in defense, yeah. In defense, that, that's really just an example because this is what we use to solve the problem. So that just folds up and, and clips on it like that. And then you can't squeeze it in the middle. Now, it doesn't stop making the mess. You know, that's another issue. But the squeezing in the middle stuff. Yeah. So it's just an example. And really, in self-defense, neither one of us do that. We don't do that. We're both more aware of that. But it makes a good example. Just like Elizabeth's hankies. It makes a good example. Yeah. All right, three-part statement, I feel, when you, can you please? And that's assertive statement because it, it makes the fe your feelings are verbally expressed. So you're not just clamping them down in. You're not just hiding them behind being a good little girl or a good mummy or a good wife or a good whatever. You're expressing your feelings. So I feel annoyed when you do this. Or I feel betrayed. Or I feel, what's some other I feel statements? Anxious. I feel anxious. Disappointed. I feel disappointed. Tired. I feel tired. Useless. Useless. Disrespected. Disrespected. Taken advantage of. Walked all over. Take it, um, being reduced to your housemaid, your, to your... Um, um, <laughs> made, being reduced to whatever. Yeah. So I feel when you, and it can be anything from squeezing the toothpaste tube, uh, washing dishes, anything, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that tend to rub you raw. So I feel. Now, usually long about now, somebody says, but what about dying to self? Mm-hmm. Well, that would be logical at that point to, to say, well, come on, pray about it. You know, you're being over, you've overreacted, let's pray about it. That can be a, a use of logic to hit somebody. So, again, support the emotions. Then, yes, we could do that. And had we been in a point with the Lord, we probably would have done that. And the Lord might have said, no more, that's it. That you don't have to put yourself through that sort of... Um, whatever, yeah, torture 
that. Look at look to me and I'll solve, solve the problem. Because that was before Daniel was a Christian. So, you know. But, yeah. Okay, now part of assertiveness training is to, to sort out with the Lord. When is it important to make a stand for, for the whole thing? And when can you just say, oh, well, that's just them. That's their personality. And I'll... I'll take my own anger and I'll give that to the Lord and I'll work it through with the Lord and just let it go. So the the Lord's the one that decides that. If it's something that's again and again and again and again, then it needs to be brought out into the open. If it's a one-off sort of thing uh, where, yeah, you can clean up your son's dirty track shoes off the the bedroom floor and, you know, he only did it once and it's because he was tired and sleepy and have been out till 12 or whatever. But if it's a repeated thing that goes on and on and on, then you need to bring it out into the open. But again, sort out the difference between the needs and the wants. If it's affecting something you need, like um, it could be a husband that, that just works seven days a week, 20 hours a day, and the wife is just so tired of it, she's just gotten to the point where she's got to bring it out in the open then you can't very well just keep dying to self on that because that's a need. I mean, if your husband's not there, how is he going to help with the kids? How is he going to have a relationship if he's not there? So in that case, that's something that needs to be brought out in the open and discussed and not just keep dying to self and dying to self and dying to self. Because dying to self, you're dying to the, the, the self's reaction on how it would like to handle it. And the self's reaction to handle it might be to become passive. Or it might be to become aggressive. So in dying to the self, you're dying to the self's way of wanting to handle the situation and doing it the Lord's way. Because it's the doing it the Lord's way is the, what the dying to self is. It's not just swallowing it and swallowing it and swallowing it. We're not dying to self on it's your problem. It's not their problem. Mm-hmm. I mean, what you're doing in this situation where Daniel's doing something to annoy you constantly, mm-hmm. then it's outside you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you've got to look in the right. Mm-hmm. But if, it's, if, if he does it a few times and you just go off the, off the ball, then you've got something within you. Yeah. Yes. You need to deal with it and you need to die to that. Yes. So, don't yourself something within you that's mm-hmm. not functioning properly, not yeah. reacting correctly. Yeah. Good. Yes, true, David. And and if if the reason why I went off at Daniel and wanted him to keep the the toilet spotless, the bathroom spotless, was an obsessive compulsive one, that that every morning before I left for work I went around and sprayed disinfectant and you know really went overboard. Then yes, that's an issue that I need to deal with and I need to work through. Or if it's that I've got to keep it spotless because if my mother-in-law comes in, my self worth is hooked to my keeping everything just perfect, then that's an issue I've got to work on. Okay. Four more minutes to finish it. Now, assertiveness expression um, might leave some of that as, let's just, assertive, assertive expression. So let's move from theory to practice. Assertiveness training is all about changing our attitudes toward people and implementing communication skills. Number one, bad old habits die hard. Our old habits die hard. The reason we have trouble with bad habits is that we don't replace them with something else. Try the following. A, be prepared to change. Now, your attitudes and thoughts must be constantly changing for the better. Yes, you must be a new and different person, holy and good. Now, does your next one go to C? D. Uh-huh. We, sorry, we've got a page that's, that's hole punched on the wrong side. B, dwell on the positives. Fix your thoughts on what is true, good, and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and dwell on the fine, good things in others. So instead of feeding my mind and festering my resentment against someone that doesn't help me keep my bathroom spotless, I need to focus on the positives. Because maybe he keeps his workshop spotless. Or maybe he's just cleaned up after and done a terrific job in cleaning up the kitchen. And he's kept that spotless. So concentrate on the positives. 
Put off the old and put on the new. Don't tell lies about each other. It was your old life with all its wickedness that did that sort of thing. Now it is dead and gone. You are living a brand new kind of life that is continually learning more and more of what is right and trying constantly to be more and more like Christ who created this new life within you. Consider how true change takes place. Question, when does a thief stop being a thief? Before you look at the answer, is, why isn't it when he stops stealing? Isn't that when he stops being a thief? No, because he could be between jobs. <laughs> so he's just waiting for the right opportunity to come along. So a thief is not a thief when he or she starts giving of themselves. When does a person stop being passive? When they start being more assertive. And then all of us, I'm sure we're all, you know, most, most everybody that I've ever run across is in that 95%. Jesus was probably one of the very few exceptions of the 5%. But most of us, we need to repent. Before effective change takes place, repentance needs to take place. Because the first principle of the kingdom is repentance. We may have to ask God's forgiveness. Then turn away from our former ways. Two, be honest and real with people. Instead of hinting at what we want, we can learn to express ourselves with dignity and sensitivity. An assertive statement has three parts. Your feelings, observations, and wants. So, I feel, when you, can you please? I feel that's your feelings about the situation. When you, whatever it is you're observing that you want to see changed, and your wants, what do you... ...involves using I statements. On the surface, they seem challenging. However, it's the only way we can honestly state how we are feeling. If you use you statements to begin with, the other person automatically becomes suspicious that you may be accusing them of doing something wrong. Leftover feelings from parents and teachers. If I always have gotten dumped on by my mother, and she always said, you never cleaned up your bedroom, you never did this, you never did that, and my husband approaches me with that statement of, you never cooked my favorite food. What's that going to do to me if I haven't worked it through? It's going to flip me into being that little girl, and here's mother giving me a, a demand again that I'm not measuring up to what she wants me to do. And it does. It flips us into to a reaction state. So use I messages. In your assertive statements, what's the three elements? I feel... When you, or because you, can you please? So making a request, please consider doing this, 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 and this. Now for the five examples, and we only had time to do two, how about I give you this as homework? See if you can write out some assertive statements for those situations. So you have a situation, you worked out a goal, and what I want you to do is write it in an assertive statement. So I feel put down when you don't let me make my own decisions about finances. Can you please? So I'll leave that for you for homework. Conclusion. Assertiveness is a skill that needs to be learned. Like all the skills we have discussed over these lessons, it needs to be practiced as well. Go and practice what you have learned. It's worth the trouble. Remember what Jesus said, the, the story about the man who built his house on the sand? What happened? It fell when all the storms of life came along. And the man that built his house on the rock, what happened? It stood firm. And do you remember how he ended that parable? Hears and do's, yeah. So we hear, we hear what Jesus has said and we go out and do it. So we don't just hear it, because we can hear all kinds of fantastic, beautiful things go in one ear and out the other, but if we don't practice it, it doesn't become ours. Reminder of the benefits of making assertive statements. You use open, honest information in a relaxed, anxiety-free way. 
You get more of your needs met without infringing on others' needs. You learn social skills that form closer interpersonal relationships. You take responsibility for what happens to you in your life. You make more decisions and valuable choices in your own life. You recognize that you have certain rights and a value system that need not be sacrificed for peace with others. You are able to protect yourself from being victimized and taken advantage of by others. You become a friend of use to yourself and maintain your own dignity and self-respect. <laughs> but what happens, Susan, if when you say to Daniel about the toothpaste, he turns around and says, yeah, well, I wish you'd put your slippers under the bed where they belong rather than leaving them out for me to trip over all the time. What do you do next? Sorry? Okay. Good. Good. So you can say, okay, Daniel. I can say, okay, Daniel, I will trade you. I will trade you the toothpaste in the, in the, in the uh, bathroom for putting my slippers where they belong. And he'll say, thank God, right? <laughs> okay, homework. You need to finish off any of the two parts of the exercise that we didn't get finished in class. And then go back over the assertive statement, the Appendix B that we were talking about, and really get inside and practice that. It's like, you know, the first time you got on a bicycle, did that feel comfortable? No, it felt strange to pedal and turn. And so the first time you start doing these things, it's going to feel uncomfortable. But it's worth the practice. In fact, you can even grab somebody and say, I'm learning about assertiveness training. Can I practice on you? And they'll probably say, yeah, good, because I need it too. So practice with each other making assertive statements. Questions? Comments? Uh-huh. Yes? When I call, they say, oh, can we ask him to call you? And I say, no. The other guy on the other line, you know how to react <laughs> for a moment. Uh -huh. He said, um, he sort of went on and say, said, because we, because we told him to call back, he never called back, so uh -huh. I'd rather wait. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you mean, I say, oh, I'm going to call him. I think there are a few seconds coming out of the phone. <laughs> okay, so that saved you a lot of frustration by saying no. I choose to do this, this, and this because. So you could have added, I'm feeling very frustrated when I just have to sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. But he responded. He expected you to be good and passive and say, yes, that's all right. But no, you were assertive. Mm -hmm. There is a place for being, uh, for not having our own way at the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the dying to self. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So it's knowing like all con yeah. It's like all conflict resolution stuff. It's when do I make a statement of this or when does the Lord say, Yeah, just let it slide. So when it when some of the clear, clear areas are when it's the, the conflict between needs and wants, when your needs are being denied and you are it, it's over that line of I am worth you know, my self-worth is being affected here in a, a sense of, you know, I'm having to sacrifice my needs, not necessarily my wants. That's one. The other is, is when is this situation playing into the game of, okay, I'll be mother and I'll clean up after Daniel and I'll do just like his mom used to do and therefore he can stay the little irresponsible boy. So you have to look at it too. So when am I rescuing someone by being passive? then I need to be assertive. Or when is it in the sense of their best good in the long run? Because that's what true love is. My rescuing somebody is not true love. That's usually passive, doing it out of my need for not having conflict. But yes, there are times when you pray about it and the Lord will say, well, just, you know, just let it go. It's part of their needs structure that they need it now and I'll work with it. And then you get your prayers going. Yeah, doesn't mean no. I don't want you to turn you all into very assertive people that every single tiny last 
bit of things in your life you challenge. No, but most of us are so far the other way that we can come back a whole long way and we still not be giving clear messages and communications. So does that answer that? Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. And so we had constantly had this conflict about clean up the room, clean up the room, which got us nowhere except mm-hmm. just destroying our relationship. Mm-hmm. So without realising, now I look at it, I can see what happened. I said to her, I need you to have that room tidy on Monday morning because that's when my cleaning lady backed mm-hmm. into the room. Mm-hmm. And then I was prepared not to say anything about it the rest of the week. So mm-hmm. really what I was doing was that I need that room tidy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wanted it tidy every day, but I was actually giving up the want, wasn't I? Mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. on the need. So that yeah. was a compromise that we could both mm-hmm. live with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times this stuff just triggers a lot of law and setting rules and you must do this which can slide into to almost aggression because we've set the ten rules in our household and they must do these ten rules yeah. any other comments? I'd like to sort of uh, <clears throat> hear myself when I'm saying I want when I'm saying I want then uh, I've got to find out I'd like to be aware of that so you need to take two steps back when you say, I want this to happen because it's a want, not a need. Where what Tina was saying, I need to have this because it's affecting somebody else, not just me. It needs to be done to keep the order in the household. Huh? That's good, Jeff. So look at when you start a sentence with, I need versus I want, then stop and look at the difference between the need and the want. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's it's important to get the message across because that's giving your expression to your emotions and to your need. And if he doesn't accept it, then you go into the next step. You know, because all you can do is deal with your own area, your own emotions, your own feeling. You can't change him in any way. And if he feels, yeah, this is uh, uh, it's not something I even need to consider. It's way out of bounds. It's, you know, Fiona doesn't have any right to ask me this because it's not, I don't see any need for it. And that's their position. Then you have to work with the Lord on why is it a need in me. And some needs it might be, like what I was saying about keeping my bathroom spotlessly clean because in the eyes of my mother-in-law I'm going to go down 10 points if she walks in and it's a messy bathroom so my need is so hooked into somebody else's approval then I have to deal with why is my needs hooked into somebody else's approval and is her approval more important than my husband's approval is her important her approval more important than the Lord's approval and work it through from that angle so yes you have to stop and take a step back and look at your need your wants because your wants are often hooked into your own issues, not somebody else's. Yeah, I'm usually trying to fix something into my scheme, my mold. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I can't change it. Yeah. Yeah, so the Lord says stop and have a look at your own wants and your own needs <clears throat> and to adjust with that because we can't change anybody else. We can only handle our own issues. And often the whole game plan gets going when this happens because I've so given away some things that when I start making that step of saying, hey, Daniel, I need this for my own sanity or whatever. He says, well, well, so what? And then you can do things like, well, I'll trade you this or trade you that. And even saying to a husband, look, th- this, this really bothers me. What are some things that I do that really bother you that you're willing to trade? And they say, well, let me get out my, <laughs> my list here. And then you go waiting them all. <laughs> yeah. But usually you'll get a good response that way because they'll, they'll often have something that they want to trade that's bugging them and, and uh, they haven't been game enough to bring it out. And you've opened the door and you can get, that's a win-win situation. Yeah, good. Any other comments? I can see why Daniel enjoys this group. She has some good comments. I suppose the exercise of with the husband and wife situation 
uh, where you write down three things you really like about the other person mm -hmm. and share that, and then write down three things you really don't like, mm -hmm. and then trade those so that those three don't like become likes. Yeah. If you're willing to trade them. If there's enough security mm -hmm. between the married partners to do that, that's an excellent idea. But that takes building some trust and opening some doors and admitting that we're not perfect and that there are things that I probably do that annoys Daniel quite a bit. So it takes letting some of the barriers down to do that. But that's a, a good idea to take three things and trade with your wife. Particularly throwing in the things you like because that helps soften the blow a little bit. <laughs> Um, went through a little exercise just um, to find out whether I really knew what team I liked and struggled a bit with that because then you get into the real nitty gritty of how I as a male try to adjust to the things that team as a female really likes and that was very difficult for me in as much as I could say, well, I think she likes such and such, but in effect, I'd have to really look into her to find out what she really likes. And I found out she likes her feet people <laughs> in, a, in a very deep emotional sort of a way, which is way beyond what I expected. That's just a little tickling thing, you know, but it's, it's, a, very, it's a very intimate thing. Intimate. Uh -huh. And uh, Daniel and Susan that too, that mm. just in order to really relate to each other, having an arm around the shoulder could be very, very, very important in, in as much as that is the best thing to do for me. And so, you can do that more, you know, it gives you a bunch of flowers, that's a long, long way. So. And the don't like? Sorry? The don't like, so they quite understand the trade. Uh, then you've got to really uh, be honest and, and, and find out the things that I'm doing that Tina doesn't like and then try to fix them. Such as leaving the two based on them. And talked about them, you know. Such as, mm -hmm. you're both doing it. Well, hang on, 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 make sure you're not betraying. No, 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 this is okay. If, if is that I'm okay? I'm <laughs> asked to do the dishes. <laughs> I used to be very helpful and help, very willing to help do the dishes. And I'd do the dishes, wonderful, and always leave one pot stand on the stove and not wipe the one the stove. Yep. I didn't like that pot anyway, but <laughs> I didn't mind doing the dishes, right? But I often didn't see that pot. And so I'd go and sit down and, you know, oh, I'm right, you know, good luck. Yep. Yep. And then we'd come in and the first thing she'd say was, you didn't do the pot again. And I think, oh, so all my good work was wasted because I neglected to do the pot. So it's now my job to look for the pot first. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Don't forget the pot. Don't forget the pot. Good word for the night. Don't forget the pot. Okay, see you next week. Does Daniel usually pray for you at the end? Yep. Would you like me to pray for you? Okay. Well, Lord Jesus, you were very assertive. You very much could speak your mind. You had the, the confidence of knowing who Father had told you to be and what he told you to do. So, Lord, you, you had no hidden agendas, and you could be very honest and open. So, Lord Jesus, teach us how to be that. Lord, help each one of us to see how you see assertiveness. And even though it can be a very logical sort of topic, Lord, I ask that you help each one of us to apply it to our heart and deal with the issues that keep each one of us, that keep us from practicing assertiveness. Lord, we know that this is a healthy way to go. Please show us when it's important and when, when to just let it go and to die to self, whatever it is that you're asking us to do. But Lord, please help each one of us to learn how valuable and worthy and how important you regard us so that out of that comes our communication styles and our assertiveness. It's a rich blessing on each person here tonight. I ask that you take the words that we've talked about and you plant those that you wish to have planted. 
and that you grow a rich crop, Lord Jesus, in us because of our willingness to obey and to do what we've heard tonight. So thank you, Jesus, for our time. A blessing on each one. In your name, Jesus. Amen. You know the routine about chairs and tables? <laughs>